God makes sure to preface the passage in Leviticus 25 with a reminder that he had just saved the Hebrews from bondage in Egypt, which was real, forced labor, and cruel bondage. The Israelites had just come out of slavery themselves and were about to enter the Holy Land. They would have not had many slaves or servants at this point, but they obviously had some because Moses saw fit to regulate it. However, it still does not restrict people from other nations selling themselves. In fact, Exodus 21 gives instructions on how a bondservant must be treated. This is an example of an ancient form of bankruptcy, where a person has lost him or herself to debt and only has one thing left to sell, their ability to work. This is a loan, and it also says that regardless of the debt, the bondservant is to be held no longer than six years unless he so chooses. Regarding Exodus 21 verse 4, if the bondservant is willing to walk away from his wife or kids, who are already bondservants with the master to begin with, then it is his own fault. It is not the master's responsibility to forgive her debt, although it certainly does not forbid him to do so if he pleases. But if the male servant did walk away without them, then he would be in defiance of the law of marriage. He has every right to stay with his family. His wife, however, is obligated to pay her debt until the master lets her free. But keep in mind, this is not to exceed six years legally. Otherwise, a woman could deceitfully rack up debt, sell herself into slavery to cover her debt, only to marry someone with a short amount of time left on his term, and then go free with him. That would be cruel to the master, who has allowed her to work off her debt. This provision is to protect those who are trying to help, not enslave harshly and indefinitely. You are completely misinterpreting this passage. Nowhere does it imply the woman provided to the Hebrew servant is a bond servant as well. The passage clearly states the woman belongs to the master, a.k.a. she is his slave. Exodus 21 does not claim she is a Hebrew woman that is engaging in her six years of servitude to pay off a debt. Otherwise, she could go free after her time is up. Exactly what would be preventing her from leaving with her husband and all of her children if she were not a permanent slave of her master? After six years, the male Hebrew servant can go free, but the master is not going to give up his property just because the male servant has sired children with her. He said, if the bondservant is willing to walk away from his wife and kids, then it's his own fault. No, it's not, because that is tantamount to blackmail. The Hebrew servant has one of two options to give up his wife and children so he can be free, or to remain with his wife and children and continue being a slave. The passage clearly states that if the Hebrew servant says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, thus forever branding him a slave. Although there is a way out of bondage for the Hebrew servant, if he chooses love over freedom, then he and his entire family are to be slaves forever. Whatever choice the Hebrew servant makes, the Bible is very clear about what happens to the children born of his union. We see the children born to a Hebrew bondservant are not extended the same rights as their father under Mosaic law. The rights of the slave master trumps those of the children born to a member of the nation of Israel. Children born to a bondservant who at the time is merely paying off a debt, are to suffer as slaves for the rest of their lives. Essentially what is taking place is the Torah is providing the slave master with a loophole to breed more slaves. But to make matters worse, the father is blackmailed with the love for his children. If he is a cold-hearted bastard, then sure, he can go free. But if he does the right thing and stays with his family, then the Torah allows the slave master to profit by gaining an additional adult male slave. How can any moral society or benevolent God turn a blind eye to this level of injustice, let alone make laws to enforce it? In addition, this passage serves to demonstrate my previous point, that the only time slavery is ever mentioned with any leniency is in reference to other Israelites. However, the Torah is very clear when it comes to slaves that are captured from other nations. Foreign-born slaves never have any rights, and once placed in bondage, are to remain slaves for life. If you feel I am in error, I challenge you to cite a single passage that specifically references 
non-Israelite slaves and the manner in which they can be legally freed from servitude. Although no such passage exists, even if it did, it would not matter. Because as we've already determined throughout the course of this discussion, just because you might find a passage that gives stipulations for how one might obtain their freedom, that does not excuse the fact an immoral practice is being allowed to go on in the first place, no matter how tightly regulated it might be. All the laws regulating slavery or indentured servitude are found in the Pentateuch, meaning five scrolls, or five books of Moses. These books were given as Israel was coming out of bondage to possess the land that God had promised to Abraham and his descendants hundreds of years earlier in the book of Genesis. The judicial laws are what governed and regulated the practice of selling oneself into servitude to pay a debt. Therefore, these laws do not command Christians in modern times to do such a thing as even have bond servants. These were rules for the nation of Israel. Indeed, the laws are all addressed to Israel, not Americans of the 21st century. In fact, the Jews did not even seem to hold to all of these rules even in Jesus' time. Yet, Jesus did not condemn them for it. The Romans were the political power in charge at the time, and they had much harsher slavery laws and were more brutal in just about every other way imaginable. Even though the Mosaic laws given may not apply to us directly, we can draw principles out of them because God never changes, at least not the biblical God. Therefore, the laws are still useful to Christians today in their own religious practices. Even though slavery was regulated by judicial laws, that does not absolve its moral implications. Jesus absolved many Hebrew judicial laws regarding murder. Does that mean murder is no longer immoral? Although Christians of the 16th to 19th centuries were not bound to the judicial laws regulating slavery in the Old Testament, they were perfectly within their rights to create new laws, and that's just what they did. The fact Jesus never directly spoke in opposition to slavery meant, as far as the Christians of the 16th to 19th centuries were concerned, slavery was perfectly acceptable within Christianity. You said, even though the law may not apply to us directly, we can draw principles out of them because God never changes, at least not the biblical God. Yes, exactly. The laws regarding slavery were not given to us directly, but these laws clearly demonstrate that slavery is an acceptable practice so long as the proper regulations are in place. Great, so modern day Christians can make new laws and go right on keeping slaves. Do you not see a problem with this logic? When something is immoral, it does not matter how you regulate it. If, as you claim, God never changes, then the act of slavery should have never been allowed to occur in the first place, or we should still have slavery today. The fact that slavery was widely practiced throughout the ancient world by Jews and Christians alike, but is currently an outlawed practice today, suggests a serious disconnect in the theistic understanding of morality. What we need to realize is that slavery, among many other subjects in the Bible, has always been a dilemma among men in our sin-cursed world all throughout history. The Bible was not written to reform society, but instead to reform our souls with God's salvation. The Bible attacks all of life's plagues provocatively from the inside out. Think about it. When someone accepts the true salvation of God's love, forgiveness, mercy, and grace, their soul is reformed. Someone who is truly saved by God's grace and lives like Christ will treat others with gracious love. The cure to slavery and the cure to all of the plagues in the world is curing the hearts of men, which is the Bible's purpose. If you can change a man's heart and soul, you don't need to outlaw slavery, because a man of God would never treat another man harshly against his will to profit from their inhumane labor. That is the Bible's approach to slavery, as well as all of life's evils. As we have seen, the Bible only attempts to regulate slavery and to focus the injustices on foreign-born slaves. Neither Mosaic Law nor Jesus Christ make any attempt to outlaw the practice altogether. You claim the cure to slavery and the cure to all of the plagues in the world is curing the hearts of men, which is the Bible's purpose. So now you speak of slavery as if it were a plague upon humankind, when throughout this entire conversation you've been making excuses for its practice. If, as you describe, slavery really was such a plague, then why does Jesus, Peter, Paul, Matthew, Luke, Timothy, and everyone else that mentions slavery in the Bible treat this issue with such disregard? 
Although you claim slavery was a judicial matter that Jesus Christ served to abolish, slavery was also a matter of morality, thus Jesus was bound to uphold the moral law. If there is indeed such a thing as a fixed standard of absolute morality, then Jesus did not live up to his role as a moral teacher. It is clear from Jesus' sermons that he was far more concerned about suppressing our natural instinct to mate, also known as lust, than he was in suppressing the immoral act of profiting from the inhumane exploitation of millions of men, women, and children across the world and throughout time. 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us that slaves unjustly suffer, and 1 Timothy chapter 6 shows us that slaves should serve their Christian masters even better, making no room for them to escape bondage. The only evidence you can provide in opposition to slavery are extremely ambiguous verses that do not mention slavery by name. However, when Jesus and the apostles do mention slavery directly, it is never in opposition or condemnation. But the final nail in the coffin is that the Bible flat out allows and even regulates slavery. If slavery is immoral, then it does not matter how well the Bible regulates it, because it still means the Bible is promoting or regulating an immoral practice. You can make whatever regulations you want to prostitution, bestiality, or illicit drug use. It still would not change the fact that according to Christian doctrine, these practices are inherently immoral. Numerous times throughout this discussion, you've made massive concessions for slavery, while failing to be consistent in your understanding that God's moral standard is absolute. If God is by nature just and right, then it would be against his very nature to inflict such horribly cruel injustices upon the world, or at the very least, he must restrain himself upon moral principle. However, all throughout the Bible we see God's unbridled fury, jealousy, and rage, inflicting incalculable harm on both his followers as well as non-believers. When I read about moral injustices in the Bible, I find it abhorrent and in total opposition to everything I hold dear. Under such philosophies as secular humanism, biblical atrocities like slavery would never be allowed to occur, let alone have laws made to regulate it. I do not feel we should have to make excuses for God. Therefore, the sheer number of immoral acts the Bible permits and regulates forces me to constantly question the Bible's integrity and authenticity. If I am to be honest with myself and follow a consistent code of moral and ethical conduct, then questions about the moral injustices contained in the pages of the Holy Bible must be accounted for. But ultimately, defending the Bible with apologetics is a fool's errand. For there is no conceivable way anyone could ever hope to justify the acts of slavery, rape, infanticide, and genocide contained in the pages of the Holy Bible. Either we accept these acts as being in accordance with the will of God, and thereby concede morality is arbitrary, or we reject these acts, and as a result, reject the Bible itself.